Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today, Dan interviews Harris Kupperman, founder and chief investment officer of Praetorian Capital Management. And today, Corey and I will talk about the bond market, maybe the stock market, and definitely the employment numbers. And remember, if you want to ask us a question or tell us what's on your mind, email us at feedback at investorhour.com. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. So the headline I'm looking at is on the Wall Street Journal, and it says, Hiring Accelerated with 336,000 Jobs Added Last Month, which is way above what was expected. Yeah, about so, hundred and f- about 150,000 more than The Economist thought. So Right. Not that economists know anything, but, right. you know, the... They usually they usually get it close because it, you know that's the way they operate. So they never see these big changes. They never see these big surges or big drops. So I don't know about you, but I mean, I I think, and it seems like the market thinks that this means that we're more likely now to get another hike, to get another interest rate hike. I think that's. On a lot of folks' minds. It seems that way because because going into this, the latest jobs report, I think there was some expectation. I was expecting the numbers to get worse. And if you look at, I mean, if you look at the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate actually stayed the same, which was 3.8%, which so it didn't go down or it didn't change. So from that standpoint, maybe... Yeah, not much has changed, but that but that monthly number certainly was was off expectations. So, yeah, it's all tied into what we've been seeing with the bond market over the last couple of weeks. I think since that Fed meeting, where they yeah talked about you know, you know higher for longer, less rate cuts in next year, and uh, basically acknowledging that inflation and growth might be higher. So, and interest rates won't be won't have a reason to go lower. So yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting last couple of weeks, I would say, since that Fed meeting, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, with the 10-year hitting like 4.8% yield, and people are talking about 5% now, um, <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, it, it's, it's just been so quick, the way interest rates went from, you know, zero to five and a half, basically. And now, if we're looking at the Fed watch tool, which is a highly reactive kind of an indicator, the odds on a November hike were like, you know, it was like 85. It was actually close to 90%, I know, at one point in the past few days. But now it's down around 69%. Um, 69% odds, I'm sorry, the odds of, a, of staying the same. I said the odds of a hike. The odds of staying the same we're like close to 90%, but now it's under 70% with the odds of a hike at close to 31%. So it would be just like the FedWatch tool to sort of start off kind of slow and then really ramp up right into the meeting. I don't know, but it's a big change overnight, obviously. And it's funny, Corey, I have to give you and I a little bit of credit. Like we've been saying higher for longer for like consistently. Since the Fed started hiking, we've been saying higher for longer, and we've been right. And now the Fed is saying exactly what we were saying. Yeah, wait a minute, higher for longer. Right. We're I was good. thinking. I, I was thinking about this <laughs> earlier, not necessarily patting anybody on the back and, or myself or you, but like it did surprise me. Just like you just said, the speed of which you know we've seen these moves the last week or two. Like, Mm -hmm. like me and you, we've been talking about this and a lot of people have been talking about it. I think others too, for a while, you know, expecting a higher rate environment for longer, but still, you know, I guess enough, (laughs) enough people weren't. And, you know, it's, it's that, that part of the market still always gets me like we could observe and think and see, think what we see is coming, but still, you know, the shoes have to drop at some point. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. 
And from here, it's like, okay, do rates go even higher from here? Because I, I mean, for like the last year or so, like I think the expectation has been, all right, rates will get to around 5% or so and, um, you know, inflation will come down and we'll all move on from there. But now it's, it's a bit, bit of a mess. I, I don't know, uh, you know, could people be overreacting, underreacting? I don't know. But it's... uh. It's definitely uh, volatile right now, and I suppose it will be until this next, you know, until through the rest of the year, really, um, until we get a better, you know, again, we're following inflation and now throw in employment uh, on top of that. It's like you're following the two big things, wondering where the, the economy is going to go uh, generally. So it's uh, it's not a small question. No, and the bond market thing, uh, everybody kind of realizes it now. It showed up on a Business Insider headline on Thursday, and the headline said, the collapse in treasury bonds now ranks among the worst market crashes in history. And then there's some bullets. Since March 2020, treasury bonds with maturities of 10 years or more have plummeted 46%, Bloomberg says. I mean, that's like that's the safest thing in the world, <laughs> treasury bonds. And, you know, down by almost half. Basically, a three-year bear market in the safest, allegedly, you know, security in the world. Yeah, I know. We, I mean, right? How many people talked about, uh, you know, the worst year for bonds since the Civil War, and now it's uh, followed up by another pretty bad one right now. So I don't think many people had that one coming, unless you f kind of foresaw the the higher rate environment coming. I mean, this was basically long term yields are are catching up to shorter term ones at this point. Right. As we're speaking now, actually, though, the shorter term yields are going up as well. So, um, you know, it's uh, that has my attention. If shorter term yields keep going up, like the two year is up right now as I'm speaking. Um, yeah. So the curve is it's like um, uninverting. <laughs> the, the yield curve is uninverting. So the long end, the rates on the long end are going higher. and. I think that's a big deal because, of course, the the inversion has been going on for, I think you know this better than I do, for well over a year now, I think. It's been quite a while. Yeah, it's probably 18 months at this point, first part of 2022. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. you know, that's the big sort of recession signal that everybody talks about. And I think the, the uh, uninversion is the part that scares folks because that's when the recession starts to become imminent in some people's eyes. Frankly, though, so far, I don't see it. I don't see 30, 336,000 jobs. I don't see any recessing happen, happening there, you know? And you could say, well, you know, the markets are weak or whatever and, and stocks are down and, and even oil is down. Yeah, but it's still 80 bucks. And they're, you know, oil companies mint money at 80 bucks a barrel. And the supply situation hasn't changed any. And the demand, you know, consistently moves up. The green energy transition is not happening. We are still growing in our use of fossil fuels, and they haven't dented the percentage of, of you know, fossil fuel global energy use, right? It's still like 82 or 83 percent or something like that. And we know that solar and wind technology is crap and there's a lot of problems with it and they're starting to come out in the press and things are happening that are getting, you know, some environmentally oriented folks kind of upset with the with the solar and wind people. So none of that's a slam dunk anymore, in my opinion. And, you know, oil prices are high enough to mint money with situation not changing a whole lot. I don't know. I, I, don't, I just don't see recession here. Maybe uh, that that doesn't mean anything because you know nobody ever does. Nobody gets the predictions right in either direction. But um, I I don't see it. Right. Yeah. No. It's like you know as you said the reversion is what I've called it of the yield curve. Typically, that's the point when the re actual recession follows a after that point. You know the, the inversion is kind of predictive, but it could go for anywhere in history. It's from anywhere the recession follows followed anywhere from six to 24 months so that's quite a wide range so when the reversion happens is when the it's the recession is seems imminent but you're right at the same time we're having we're seeing gdp numbers that are 
being expected to go higher. Um, job market not quite cratering at the moment, and you know, will it? Will it? Maybe uh, ahead. You know, maybe it's all all ahead still. So, I think the at the end of the day, the whatever ends up happening, I think the answer is a little higher inflation than people have been used to right. for longer. Uh, I think. <laughs> I think that's the, you know, if we have a, if we get into a recession and the Fed cuts rates, you know, will, infl- can inflation just stay higher and, and, or snap back to a higher level? Sure. And another thing I think is going overlooked in all of this is, you know, we talk about like flipping the last 20 or 40 years on its head. Another thing contributing to all these rising bond yields is the Fed and the Treasury issuing tons of, of uh, bonds into the market to finance spending. Um, plus, the Fed is cutting its balance sheet by about it's you know it's still at like five trillion of Treasuries, but they've they're down. I did look at the math this week; it's about fourteen percent. So that is stuff that was like okay during the last fifteen years to do without flipping out the market, but it's not okay anymore. And so I don't know. We might be getting to a point where stuff actually breaks as as they say and we'll uh get some more i don't know maybe the fed will come up with some new emergency measures or something coming up here soon that that people aren't yeah. expecting I, but yeah i don't know what those Corey, would be, Corey, but, i've heard people but, say i've heard some it, folks say who who have done some um real work on this they say you know this move in treasuries up to 4.8 recently 4.8 percent on the 10 year is that that move was totally like new issuance hitting the market and there was like a quarter trillion in a day <laughs> you know if you watch like the right. you know the national debt clock <laughs> it ticked up a quarter trillion right. in one day um boy you don't need a lot right. of those days to <laughs> get interest rates moving up to get that curve reverting <laughs> i mean wow right and so i think that's what's happening too i mean this was that part was expected, you know, because once that debt ceiling deal mm-hmm. was reached, um, this was going to happen, which again brings it back to, you know, you try to ignore the politics of, well, not try to ignore, but you try to like keep in perspective whether politics like mm-hmm. has an influence on the markets. And right here it does, right? Like it's clearly, um, uh, <laughs> clearly having an influence. And we, you know, and and we see, we're seeing right now whenever anybody tries to, you know, upset the apple cart even slightly by like cutting spending as some of these the Republicans mm-hmm. want to right now. Like now there's no speaker of the house because somebody just wants to cut the bu- wants to cut the budget. Like it's it's yeah. it's wild. It's um, it just shows you how debt addicted we all are. Yeah, and uh, times are changing though with with the interest rates not at zero anymore yeah i i like your take times they are changing and yeah. you mentioned that um you know flip everything upside down idea that we we got it from vitaly katz and nelson and i just sort of adopted it and i i totally agree you know in zero interest rates are inverted to higher for longer interest rates um is one of the main ones and you know no inflation is inverting to mm, some inflation persisting and and inflation is is a more persistent phenomenon than most people think so yeah i think we invert all of this stuff and you know one of those things too has been covered by ray dalio which you've just alluded to which is internal conflict internal political conflict and internal societal conflict inside of countries is ramping up to levels that he says you know we haven't seen since maybe the 1930s or something, and then external conflicts between countries too influence, you know, they influence one another. And um, the, I, I just feel like, I don't know, maybe there's a there's a book here about the inversion of life, you know, from the last few decades to now. Feels like a major, major inflection point. And I think, you know, what's happening in the financial markets just kind of it, it, it's an echo from all parts of our life and you can just look in the stock market and it's like an analog for what's happening in all the rest of our life agreed yeah it's uh, there's a lot of different trends converging right now you got you know demographics um monetary policy blunders of yeah. the past <laughs> um 
just kicking the can down the road. Is the road closed ahead? I don't know. Uh, but definitely, you know, 8% mortgage rates, I think, will get anybody's attention. Yes, <laughs> they will. But, you know, it's persistent. Like I saw on Redfin recently um, how they were talking about, yeah, mortgage rates are soaring toward 8%, but new listings are holding up, in fact. I mean, elsewhere, it's being reported that, you know, the listings are way down and purchase applications are way down, et cetera. cetera. But, you know, Redfin is kind of in the housing market (laughs) for a living, and they're reporting the opposite, which makes sense to me with the kind of structural shortage of housing. That's hard to put a dent in a market when you're that short on supply for the reasons that we've discussed, you know, people holding on to their existing homes because they have, you know, sub 3% or 3% mortgages or even, you know, sub five, like most of them are sub five. So it just keeps the market tight. And I tend to think that housing prices will adjust to mortgage rates and people will say, you know, we got to have a house. And historically speaking, like um, 8% ain't that bad. Right. Yeah. I know people who are uh, alive in the 70s and and, and Mm -hmm. 80s will tell you, don't forget those times. And, um, you know, I'm different. I I got an email from somebody this week about just like the creative financing that was going on during that time and how kind of he believes the same could happen this time. And we see that with different financing deals right now, you know, um, that benchmark fixed rate may be nearing eight percent but there's different ways to get it down um so yes people will adjust i just think we're seeing the adjustments happening yeah. right now i think so we'll see how far the world needs to adjust to our yeah, i'm not saying any of it is easy or pleasant or whatever but i don't think it's uh i don't think eight percent mortgages are a killer for the housing market i guess is the real point right now with the structural yeah. Isn't going so away. it's not all bad news. And in my Stansberry Digest on Friday, I was talking about how, you know, 5% T-bills, you know, like the short end, the one to three monthers, like that's that's a good thing, you know, because it gives you a hurdle rate. You got something in your account where you can say, okay, if you want me to take more risk, it's got to be bad. It's got to be more appealing than leaving my money in T-bills earning 5% pretty safely. Right. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Especially if you're on a short timeline, like in retirement like and have a huge nest egg like what's what's better than five percent you know virtually guaranteed pretty pretty darn good so you know t-bills energy housing there's some there's some things you can do and our guest today has a thing that he loves to do i I think you and i both totally agree with him on his favorite trade which i won't give it away we'll we'll talk about it um in a minute with him and our guest is harris kupperman cuppy those of us uh, who know him on Twitter know him as Cuppy, and he's a great Twitter presence, lots of good posts, and as you'll find out, a great talker, just a, a good guy to talk to about markets. He speaks plain English and is very smart and very experienced. Uh, so let's talk with Cuppy, Harris Kupperman. Let's do it right now. Folks, stocks are near all-time highs. AI has added trillions to just a handful of stocks, and everyone's convinced the market can just shrug off the biggest and fastest interest rate hikes in history. It's textbook bubble behavior, and it's why my colleague Joel Littman is stepping forward with the biggest warning of his career. Now, Joel warned of the coming disaster in 2008. He nailed the market bottom in 2020 and the top in 2022, both nearly to the day. Now, he says he's more worried about stocks than he's been in the last 16 years. The next crash is underway for a specific reason that almost no one is paying attention to. He's issuing a rare recommendation to put nearly everything into a completely different approach, the one that the rich have used to make a fortune in every crisis for decades. It's not gold or anything else you've likely considered. But Joel's used it to show his deep-pocketed professional clients an 87% win rate with gains above 100%. And in the coming crisis, it could show you double-digit income and hundreds of percent gains over and over. I urge you to tune in and hear Joel's stunning warning 
along with one of the greatest market secrets you can ever learn. Just head over to www.crashalert2023.com for full details. You do not want to miss this. Head to www.crashalert2023.com right now to make sure you're on their list for updates again. That's www.crashalert2023.com. It's 100% free. Cuppy, welcome back to the show. Nice to see you again. Hey, thanks for having me on. And just so we know, this is uh, not investment advice here. It's just two guys chatting. I second the motion. All right. <laughs> with, with that out of the way, um, so I'm looking through your latest uh, Cuppy's Corner and sort of nodding along and thinking, yeah, a lot of people seem to be, I feel like there's an implication in a lot of what I read and hear that we just need to get things back to normal and get interest rates back down and everything's going to be fine and we're going to be back in a bull market and everything's going to be okay. Okay? But I, I don't think anything like that is the case. We had a guest, Vitaly Katzenelson, on the show, a friend of mine. You, I'm sure you know who he is. Yeah. Um, and he said, just take the last 20 years or 30 or whatever you want and invert it. And that's what we're, that's <laughs> what we're going to get for the next 20. And I think, I mean, I don't know if he still feels that way, but I definitely do. Absolutely. I think that's actually the, the best way to say it. Just invert the last <laughs> 20, 30 years. It's this weird anomaly. Uh, no, I think the world's going to look very, very different for the next uh a uh, while and i think everyone's playing the, the old playbook and i think they're all gonna get run over um I look uh, I, I do a lot of macro investing i do a lot of inflection investing i think you know for what i do this is gonna be incredible because uh the government bureaucrats around the world they're gonna play whack-a-mole as all these things pop up and if i know anything about governments they'll you know screw things up worse while trying to fix it it's just gonna create tons of opportunity i'm super excited <laughs> Yeah, I am too. And I feel like, uh, I don't know, I just feel like, in a way, investing is back. It was yeah. kind of gone. When, when interest rates are zero and negative, it's gone, right? <laughs> the, the investing is gone. Now it's back. Right. I mean, for, I don't know, the last couple of years, anyone who had a crazy idea could get funding for it. And there was no profit motive whatsoever i mean it was just revenue growth and you give dollars away for 80 cents and you, you could grow your business you could steal a market share and these things had crazy values and it was really tough for guys like me i mean look i, I did very well i'm not going to cry but <laughs> it was tough because you look at the screen you say what the hell are these people thinking and uh you know i, I think it's finally coming to a different sort of world a much more volatile world which is you know something i i, I love and something where you know, there's going to be great trends to play. You know, uh, for a long time, you just had to buy Apple and do nothing. And you know, I think it's a better world for guys like me that actually can add value. Yeah, Apple actually down double digits since like late July. So yeah, let's talk about, um, I feel like we have to talk about the one topic. I don't even know if you're, you, you sound excited when I hear you talk about it, but you know, it's like, oh, you're having Copperman on the show. Oh, you got to talk about uranium. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, I, I hope you understand that when you show up, we must talk about uranium. Yeah. Let's talk about uranium. My current view is, um, sure. It's, it's had a nice run here, but, um, all the fundamentals are in place for this to continue. So it, maybe you missed the first leg up or whatever, but I, I think this continues. What do you think? Well, I think it continues too because nothing's changed. I mean, if you're running a 50 million pound deficit each year on 210 of demand and the deficit actually grows in 2025 from 2024, well, where do the pounds come from? And I, I don't know where the pounds come from because there's that warehouse in the sky that seems to be feeding pounds, but it doesn't really exist. I mean, what's really happening is that everyone's drawing down inventory. You know, there's no magical warehouse where they just keep, you know, emptying it. And you can only draw inventory so much until you can't run your reactor anymore. And at, at that point, you have to restock. And I think we're going to start seeing restocking. We are seeing restocking. This will be the first year in a bunch of years where uh, contracting has actually kept pace with uh, consumption. I mean, it's weird to think about you can run a business where, you know, you use a pound, you don't buy a pound. But that's how it's been working for many, many years. And this year, we're going to actually tread water. But at some point, they have to restock. And I don't know where those pounds come from because there's, there's no supply. And if you're going to draw down a million pounds a week, <laughs> eventually, someone's going to run out. And, you know, when you run out, you pay the market price. And if the market price is up a couple hundred from here, that's the price you pay. 
And so, no, I love this trade. It's our, by far our largest position. And um, I think it's going to keep trending. It's, I think it's going to be very, very volatile. You, you have to remember that, uh, you know, the fiscal uranium market is really, there's about a half dozen uh, physical traders that trade most of it. There's another 10, 20 guys that trade little bits and pieces of it. The, the, the physical market's about 10% of the total market, you know, it's about 20 million pounds a year. And so, you know, it, it moves around a lot. It goes up a couple bucks, goes down a buck or two. It, it, it's going to be really volatile. And uh, then you have things like Sprott, which are going to have you know, amplified volatility on that. And then you have your juniors with even more volatility. So, you know, I don't think these things are for trading, you know, day to day, week to week. It's, it's really for putting a position on and letting it play out. Yeah. So I've been sort of talking about this since, um, I don't know, 50-ish dollar uranium telling people, you know, where you, when you sell it, when you make something for 50, you know, and it costs 60 or so, um, <laughs> to make it, that's kind of bad. You know, the, the, the whole world goes into liquidation mid sixties though. Now per pound on uranium, like 66 bucks, but that doesn't do it. Does it just uh, six bucks to the good is not. Well, I'm not sure if the you know the production cost is 60. If the world wants 210 million pounds, I think it's more like 70 or maybe 75. And you know, from there, you're not going to do it for free. You have to earn a profit. And with interest rates where they are, you know, you have to borrow the money to build your mine or turn your mine back on. I mean, I think you need 80 or 90 to really turn on mines. And you know, we've seen a couple of mines like uh, Langer Heinrich restart, but I mean, those guys are going to come in way over budget. Um, you know, just. I mean, their production cost isn't going to be what the, the feasibility was a couple of years ago. And, you know, I think they're taking a lot of risk by turning their mine on early, but that's what they chose to do. But most mines aren't really turning on. And, you know, there's going to be a couple like MacArthur River turn on, but that doesn't get you to 210 million pounds. And no, I think you need much higher pricing. And look, if you could buy a commodity that's in deficit below the cost of producing it, most likely you're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> that, that's the history. You just have to be patient. And I've been in this for two years. We got in when, uh, you know, I started buying when uh, physical was 31. And here we are in the low 60s. And, you know, I think it's going a lot higher. It's a great trade so far for me. And, you know, we're only, you know, a double into it. I agree. I think it is going a lot higher. I looked at um, copper also and incentivization prices which I'm putting incentivization at around five bucks a pound in copper now. But historically, historically, I've noted that you need double incentivization to really get capital to move. Right. There's no rational robot investor out there who says, oh, incentivization price, you know, achieved massive capital goes into copper mining at five bucks. No, it's, it's got to be 10, which like, you know, who's talking about $10 copper right now? Nobody. No, no. I mean, look, copper's going much higher too, I think. Um, you know, the, the only thing that holds back copper really is that uh, I think you're going to be in a really weird economic situation. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if GDP goes up or down from here. I mean, it's all up to a couple of politicians, really. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I can see a world where, you know, actual copper demand doesn't grow. Uh, I can see a world where it grows very fast. Uh, it, it's a lot, you know, I think, more binary than something like uranium, where, look, you build a, a nuclear power plant, and you're going to run it for 50 years. And it doesn't turn off. It doesn't stop. It just keeps going. Right. Uh, it's totally not price uh, sensitive to what happens in the economy. There's other peaker plants that turn off. Like, I, I just think it's an amazing trade. But no, I think copper is going to be great. Uh, I think there's definitely a floor under copper. And, you know, there's, there's, I'm not sure where the ceiling is, uh, d depending on what you think happens in the economy. I think you can say the, the same thing for about a lot of commodities, quite honestly. Um, right. Look, the, the global economy is really quite strong and demand is up and six billion people want the same standard of living that I do. And, you know, if you look at my copper intensity and you look at my you know, oil intensity, like I'm sitting here in Puerto Rico, I'm blasting the air conditioner at 65 degrees here. I drive a truck to work. Like think of the guys in India, you know, they're going to want the same stuff I have. Um, right. And I think they'll get there in the next uh, decade or three. Uh, I believe in human progress, and I don't know where the stuff all comes from. Right. And I mean, there's, you know, six billion, and there's another, you know, billion or so who have like zero access to electricity right now, you know, either, either zero or, you know, spotty access to electricity. So I tend to believe that, um, and I want to get your take on this, I tend to believe that um, just kind of, normal if you can call it that normal if you can call it that economic growth globally 
creates enough demand for things like uranium and copper and other things that you don't need, um, you know, for example, like a green energy transition, which I don't think really happens anyway. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, I think there's tons of demand just as 6 billion people join the, the modern world that a billion of us live in. And right. I don't think you need a green energy transition. I'm not really even sure what that really means. I mean, it just basically is a bunch of bottlenecks <clears throat> and, you know, reduce efficiency of everything. I don't know why you'd want to reduce efficiency. You want to improve efficiency. Uh, right. I, I don't know why you need green electricity. It doesn't make any sense to me. But, uh, you know, politicians will do what they do to subsidize their buddies and, you know, steal from guys like me. And it's just a fact of life, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's always going to be roadblocks in the way. And, you know, this is the the newest roadblock to the civilization growing. But no, I, I just think there's huge demand for this, uh, the, the whole periodic table, really. And mm -hmm. I, there's been massive underinvestment, and there's going to be a catch-up phase, and the catch-up phase is going to have higher prices, and that's going to be very inflationary, and the central banks will do what they can to slow it down. They'll probably make it worse, because that's what, you know, all government bureaucrats do. And I think you'll have a very inflationary cycle. I mean, people forget that when you raise interest rates, uh, it's inflationary. It's not deflationary. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it maybe makes, uh, you know, demand for homes go down, but it definitely also, you know, makes the, the cost of an oil well go up because you have to finance it. <laughs> so there's a push and pull and people think it's all, you know, you press a button and suddenly inflation slows because you raise rates. And that's not how it works. Uh, you know, some right. things, you know, uh, go up in price. I'm glad you brought this up. I'm glad you brought inflation up because in that latest Cuppy's Corner that I was talking about that I read, you made a real point of this. You said, you know, you can read about it in books, but you don't understand it until you live it and see it and see the, you know, the the division that it creates. You know, some people make money off of it and others suffer from it. And you're obviously squarely in the, you know, higher for longer camp there. Yeah. Um, again, as you just pointed out, uh, it defies logic to me, this widespread belief that the Fed does have, they have these simple levers, these primitive levers, and they can push the button and adjust, tweak, whatever, a 26-odd trillion economy at their pleasure. And I think, I guess we're on the same page. Maybe maybe you're a bad guest for me because we agree on everything. <laughs> I need to get somebody I disagree with more. Yeah, but you uh, you see inflation going longer, you know, it's remaining higher for longer. It sounds yeah, like. I think it'll be a bunch of different sine waves. Uh, you know, inflation will come on really hot, then it'll cool down a little, and then it'll come on hot again, and it'll cool down again. And I, I think the, the the trend is up and to the right. You know, I I think we'll take out the prior CPI high that that happened uh, about eighteen months ago. I think we'll take it out. You know, at some point in the next year or two. And then we'll just start making new highs again in inflation. Uh, I, I think, you know, inflation is structural. And, uh, you know, what we learned, uh, I think needs to be unlearned. You know, people think that Volcker took rates up and that killed inflation. That didn't kill inflation. You, you had a demographic wave that kind of crested in the, you know, late 70s, early 80s. And then Reagan came in place and he passed a bunch of landmark legislation that uh, broke the back of unions. And... It wasn't just uh, wages, you know, by breaking unions. It, it was efficiency. I mean, the, the cost to transport railroad, you know, just like a, a shipping container, I think it dropped by like two-thirds or something within two years. Like, uh, you know, they, they deregulated uh, aviation so that uh, airlines would fight on ticket prices. What do you think happened to ticket prices? It collapsed, which made the world a lot more efficient because you had to be an efficient operator, which also made, you know, business people more efficient because they, they paid less and the, the plane showed up more likely on time. Like all these deregulation uh, things they did uh, dramatically reduced uh, inflation. And because he started at such a high point, he looked brilliant. But, you know, uh, Volcker got the credit because no one wants to ever give Reagan credit for anything, but it was Reagan who did it. What we've learned is that interest rates, when you raise them, tends to be inflationary. Uh, when, you, when you lower them, all you do is make uh, publicly traded QCIPs go up and some risk assets like housing and commercial real estate. But really, interest rates just are tied to, you know, asset prices. And QE, QT, it's tied to asset prices again. I don't think it actually has any transmission mechanism to the real world. I mean, look, j raised rates now 500 and change BIPs. Like, what does it do to me? You know, I, I have a tiny little mortgage. Like, it's, it's still fixed for another decade. Like, I don't really care. Uh, I have uh, three car loans. Like, 
they're, they're termed out. I, I don't really care. I mean, I got a tiny little bit of credit card debt. Like, great. Charge me 500 bips more. Like, I don't care. Like, and I think the average middle guy, middle class guy is roughly in the same spot I do. Maybe the credit card debt hits them a little harder. But, I mean, we're talking about a couple hundred bucks a month. It's just, it's just, it's a nothing. All it does when you raise interest rates is it screws with banks and maybe the banks lend less. But the banks aren't lending less. They're, they're actually accelerating their lending again because they have to catch up to all of the, the low interest uh, loans they made. It's actually accelerating the economy. It's just with a little bit of a lag. I don't think interest rates really do anything to the real economy because there's, there's no transmission mechanism, really. And, you know, if you don't have a transmission mechanism, all you do is you hurt some private equity guys and some VC guys, which is great. Go hurt them. They've had 30 good decades, 30 good years. Like, go get them. But everyone else, I don't, I don't think it matters. Really? What about, um, what about new home buyers? First time home buyers? Well, I mean, the price of housing is going to drop. It's a, you know, it's it's a asset tied to uh, interest rates. I think it's gonna be great for new home ho- buyers. They, they just need to wait another year. Like I think they're gonna get some bargains. There's gonna be right. a bunch of guys that are over levered speculators, and they're gonna cough up homes. And I think you'll, if you're a new home buyer, this is great. I mean, you should be super happy about all this. Um, I, but there's no real transmission mechanism. So some guy has five Airbnbs, and they cough up two of them. Like, who cares? It it, it, it just doesn't really impact the real economy in my world. That is not a view I hear very often. In fact, I would say <laughs> at, at all. Well, I mean, if you raise interest rates, it's, it's obviously inflationary because you constrict supply of stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. So the price of everything goes up and then return on capital goes up. So it makes everything more profitable, which you know, drives the economy. It's just like, I mean, think back on it. The, the 2010s, we had very slow economic growth and interest rates were zero. And they were doing QE the whole time. Maybe people should look at that and say maybe QE and low interest rates uh, lead to low economic growth. And here we are. They keep raising rates and nominal uh, GDP is racing ahead. It's like 7 8% right now. Like maybe mm-hmm. high interest rates are really good for nominal. And, you know, nominal is the way you cure a budget deficit and you, you cure, you know, pretty crazy uh, you know, government debt because, you know, you, you just devalue the, the, the value against the GDP. So higher interest rates seem inflationary and good in, in many, many ways. I mean, I think that what, what we have is you have this weird uh, one percenter uh, recession right now where, you know, one percenters, <laughs> they don't usually make their money on salary. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they, they make their money on asset appreciation and they usually, you know, somehow earn fees on their asset appreciation or they just have assets that go up and they extract capital at low interest rates. And assets stopped going up two years ago. And so these guys are all getting cry, you know, they're all whining and crying. And then, you know, all their costs of living went up, you know, uh, that their, their nanny wants twice as much money and private school got more expensive and, you know, they're getting taxed and all these other things are going on in their lives. They're getting squeezed on both ends. And for the first time in 30 years, these guys uh, are getting squeezed on both sides. They don't know what it is. So they're crying and calling it a depression. But the other 99% of people are getting huge wage increases. I mean, if you want a job, there's plenty of jobs. I mean, you, you can get, you know, giant wage increase if you ask for it. No one's going to fire you. And you want 20% more, just ask for it. You'll get it. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen huge growth in the, the, the other 99% of people. And I think the economy is doing quite, quite well, actually. It, it's just... Uh, assets that, that are suffering. And, you know, I think assets were in a crazy bubble for a very long period of time. And if assets dropped in half, I think they'd still be in a bubble. <laughs> so I, I think it's, it's just uh, nature kind of healing in a way. Sorry, I don't even know what the question was. I'm rambling. <laughs> no, that's okay. We bring you on for a good ramble. That's <laughs> We like your rambles. So what else do you like? Besides, I want to get a little more concrete for our listener here. Um, you like uranium, you like copper. Is there anything else in this environment that jumps out at you? Well, I, I love uranium. Let's let's put it uh, straight. I love uranium. Oh, you love copper, uranium. Okay. Copper, I'm kind of ambivalent about. I, I, I could see how it could go either way. Um, I think uh, energy services are a place to be in energy itself. Um, you know, the, the way I think about energy services is that uh, we've underspent now since 2014 uh, in, in terms of CapEx on long lead cycle projects. And uh, there's a huge catch-up phase now needed because global, you know, liquids demand grows about 2 million barrels a year every year. 
And so to catch up, you need to catch up to prior levels, except for remember inflation. So if you get back to 2014 levels of spending, you're only really spending about half as much because, you know, it's, it's been eight years of uh, inflation. So you really need to take out 2014 levels. And, you know, you're looking at hundreds of billions, maybe even a trillion dollars a year incremental that needs to be spent to get uh, oil out of the ground. And uh, I want to be in the way of that spending because it's going to last for many years. So I own energy services uh, offshore, uh, two names, uh, Valeris and Tidewater. Uh, we own Valeris, the largest owner of uh, offshore drilling equipment in the world. And then uh, Tidewater is the largest owner of OSVs in the world. Uh, they're, they're both, I think, very well run, uh, very cheap. Uh, they, they've done well for me. I think that they got a lot more to go. Uh, I, I mentioned a company, Journey Energy, uh, in Canada. It's, it's sort of a smaller name, but... Uh, you know, they have a bunch of uh, late cycle, low decline assets and uh, the money's already been spent. Uh, you don't have to worry about oil field uh, service inflation. They've spent the money already. Now it's just a question of getting the, the oil out of the ground. I mean, these are low decline sort of assets. And if you're bullish oil like I am, you know, every dollar that oil goes up is incremental, you know, dollar in the pocket of the company. Uh, and I, I think oil, you know, goes up, it, you know, it's, it's going to be volatile. But that cash flow is going to you as a shareholder. They're going to do a bit of drilling. I think they're going to do uh, quite a lot of acquisitions of other low decline assets. Uh, it's a well run roll up by a guy that I think is a really smart operator. You know, fair disclosure, we own a ton of it, uh, and uh, I like things like that. I, you know, I don't want to be on the wrong side of this oil field services inflation that I expect. You know, I don't want to be the guy in the Permian drilling wells all over the place that you know declined eighty percent in the first two years. I want to be the guy who's buying someone else's wells and trying to limp them into the sunset. But I, I really like energy a lot. I think that's a great place to be. I see. So just, just for clarification, um, you don't like that those first, whatever call it, year or two of decline. You want to come in after that in a longer life property and just milk it until the <laughs> until the cows come home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything I do is cash on cash investing. I, I, I like cash. And I don't want cash mm -hmm. going to the ground. I want cash coming to me. And so, you know, the guys right. drilling holes in the ground, you know, God bless them because, the, you know, they're helping my energy services companies. But I don't want to be putting my money on the ground. I want to put, put the money in my pocket. And so, you know, uh, Journey Energy, uh, they, they've already, they're buying other people's wells. In many cases, mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're buying wells that, um, larger players have that have uh, uh, asset retirement liabilities and the large players want to get the AROs off their uh, balance sheet. And mm -hmm. Journey's happy to take on those AROs because uh, there's, there's still a lot of cash there. There's a lot of cash flow. Mm -hmm. And as uh, oil prices go up, uh, you know, when those wells finally, uh, you know, end and they, they, they have to be remediated, that gets pushed out into the future. And so, you know, when you DCF that, you create a lot more value if you're bullish oil. Obviously, it cuts the other direction. If you're bearish oil, you know, or the, if the price of oil goes down, you know, the, the, those obligations become current much sooner. So it, it's a highly levered uh, opportunity to oil, though it's not levered with uh, debt because, you know, I don't really care much for debt. I like operating leverage. And here you just have pure operating leverage. Right. And again, for our listeners' sake, these are in Alberta. That's where the assets are. So y Yes, it's in Alberta and it's listed in Canada. Yeah. But my point of mentioning Alberta was, you know, you walk out the door blindfolded and throw a dart and, you know, oil starts coming out of the ground. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place to find these assets. All right. right energy. Right. And it's, it's decent assets. It's not incredible assets. It's decent assets. But, you know, they're right. reasonably low cost. They're delineated mm -hmm. and they're producing. And the, the region has been producing for a long time. And Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, Outside of that, you know, energy and oil food services and uranium, there's not much that gets me going right now. I mean, I think we're going to have a really, really weird, volatile period. I think there's going to be a time at some point in the not so distant future where you're going to want to buy some gold and hold on to it. Not yet, but it's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have it on my radar. I've kind of nibbled a little and stopped out. I, I think that's going to be something that's going to be really juicy. Uh, you know, I, th I think banks are in for a world of pain especially Canadian banks. I think you, you, know, you can just shoot them in the back all day long. <laughs> I, I, I think a bunch of them are going to have to get zeroed. Uh, yeah. The Canadian banks, all five of them? <laughs> uh, let, let, let's, let's not pick favorites. But uh, yeah. I, I think right. they're in a world of pain. 
<laughs> but but right. I, I think, look, I think it's going to be a really volatile time. And I think you know, every year, you know, the narrative is going to change. The story is going to change. There'll be different things to do. But for right now, I mean, uranium is just the best, you know, in, in terms of a risk reward in, in my mind, because the, the reward could be so monumental and the, the risk seems kind of low. It, it, you know, things can happen. There can always be some sort of black swan and, you know, maybe, you know, there's an accident somewhere and it's a terrible trade. But outside of that, like, you, you can't run a deficit below the cost of producing this stuff. I mean, I guess one other thing I'd flag for you is uh, there's still a huge uh, refugee crisis. Everyone's leaving the Northeast. They're going to Florida. Uh, they tend to be wealthier refugees because uh, they have the ability to leave. And, uh, you know, if you own land in the state of Florida, you could do very well. And, you know, we own a ton of St. Joe. Uh, it's uh, another large position for us. Oh. We spoke about it last time. And, uh, you know, they, they keep selling lots. Uh, interest rates went up and doesn't seem to have impacted them much. Uh, the, the demand is there and it's mostly cash buyers. God, St. Joe, that's a blast from the past for me. I owned a bunch of those land companies like starting around 2002, three. And of course they just took off like rocket ships. Um, St. Joe. Wow. St. Joe was, was a problem for a while, wasn't it? I mean, I remember, um, who was the big investor who got involved? I forget his name. Bruce Berkowitz. He's still involved. Berkowitz, um, right? You know, he he brought in new management and they fixed it. It took a while, but you know, they they, they really changed the business model uh, dramatically, and mm -hmm. it's a much better business now. Plus, they didn't have the demographic uh, wave like they have today. You know, now there's just huge demand to move down there. It's 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 just a totally different opportunity. Like I, I, we didn't right. own it in the past. We only got involved in 2020. Yeah, it was like it was like in the teens. You know, after the financial crisis, you know, everything sort of went bust. And then and everybody uh, I, I remember listening to uh, uh, David Einhorn's presentation, you know, why it was why he was short. And of course, it, it went way down from its bubbly price. But now it's back in the 50s, which is amazing. Yeah, it's been quite. Uh, it's, yeah. The company keeps putting up solid numbers. And uh, yeah. You know, I, I think people are going to keep moving to Florida, you know, not every quarter is going to be good, but right. as that land keeps depreciating, they own about 170,000 acres of land. I think the book value keeps going up and it trades at a huge discount to book value. Wow. Okay. Um, like adjusted, like, you know, if you look at the actual book value on the balance sheet, you're not talking about that. You're talking about adjusting to market. Right, right. I mean, yeah. look, they bought the land in the 1930s. I <laughs> they take on the books for nothing, really. No, yeah. I, I, the, the, the book value is uh, what the land is worth today. And you know, I think those acres are worth quite a lot today. You know? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if book value was more like two to 300 a, a share versus, you know, in the 50s where it's trading today. Um, yep. And anytime you could buy something really cheap with a strong tail, when you do it? And that's been the history of my life. All right. You got any other of those land companies or just that one? Just that one. I, I run a really concentrated portfolio. We try to buy the best. Uh, we, we don't buy second tier assets and, you know, buy the cheapest thing with the strongest tailwind and, you know, just let it happen. You know, it's always been right. what works best for me. So I'm glad you used the phrase second tier because another thing you said in your recent Cuppy's Corner was, um, I'm trying to find it. Didn't you say something like you look for second tier global macro trends? Correct. So what are the first, what's the first tier like interest rates, inflation, or what, 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 what are the first and second tiers? So I mean, first tier is currency interest rates and what the S and P is going to do. I don't think I have much edge there. I mean, historically I've guessed right more often than I've gotten it wrong, you know, and I actually done a bit better than I would have expected to have done. But, um, you know, the, all the smartest people in the world are competing with you and you, you don't want to go into the big leagues. Uh, you know, I, I want to go where no one's paying attention. You know, these second tier markets where I, I don't want to say you're, you're competing against idiots because, you know, a lot of people are really smart. It's just that something happens in, in, in the sector and no one notices and you can show up and buy a lot of stock and, you know, you're not competing with everyone else in, in Wall Street that, 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 that's, you know, fixated on what's happened. And so, you know, you already know you're right. Like, it's, it's different. Like, if you want to bet on currencies, you're betting on what happens six months from now. If <laughs> you're betting on one of my second tier things, you already know you're right. You just got to, like, buy it. You just press the buy button. It's easy. You know, it's, it's, a, it, it's just, a, I think, a better strategy, a better place to go hunting. You know, 
Like, like let's go back to uranium. Like there's no mm-hmm. coverage of the, the sector. There's, no one covers it. Uh, a couple of banks on Wall Street picked up coverage in the last few weeks because their clients were asking about it, but they don't know anything about mm-hmm. uranium. They just took uh, some data that the Industry Association puts together and they just, you know, you know, cut and pasted the data into their own letterhead. Like that's, that's not research. The Industry Association's <laughs> gotten it wrong for decades now. Whatever happens, they always kind of say it's roughly balanced and it's not roughly balanced. It was huge surplus for many years and now a huge deficit. Like they, they, they've gotten it wrong. And so all these uh, banks aren't really covering it. Effectively, there's two hedge fund buddies of mine that, that, that cover the sector. I'm kind of on their coattails. And that's it. No, one, no one's paying attention. No one knows. There's a couple of weirdos on Twitter, but they don't have enough capital to influence the price. And that's it. And, you know, you go to places like that where, you know, you just have to listen to someone. You say, that makes a ton of sense. And you just go buy it. Like, I hate these hard situations. You know, copper, I think, is a first year. It's, it's harder. You know, if something happens in the supply-demand b- uh, balances in copper, some guy at Glencore is going to figure it out a month before I figure it out. Like, I don't want to go against Glencore. They're the smartest guys in the world. Glencore doesn't have a uranium desk. It's second tier. <laughs> they don't care. Like, I like that. You know, that, that's the trade for me. <laughs> okay. So what uh, is there a second tier trend that you're looking at that you're not involved with yet? Uh, there's a lot of them. I mean, we're, we're following lots and lots of sectors, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll probably have 100 sectors that are on our blotter that we're actively engaged in. And, but we rarely have more than five to eight on the books. Uh, so there's things we're watching. We're obviously you know, aware of what's happening. And uh, we're waiting for something to inflect. You know, I think the biggest mistake people make is they buy something cheap because it's cheap. No one cares if it's cheap. People care if uh, the first and second derivative are uh, you know, going in the right direction. And you know, first derivatives, uh, uh, revenue obviously is the one that Wall Street cares about the most, and then earnings. I don't know why they care about revenue instead of earnings, but that's what they care about. And so if the rate of change is accelerating, the second derivative's up and the first derivative's up, then you buy it. And so we're watching these things. We're saying, yeah, this is a really cheap sector. It's bombed out. It's destroyed capital for a long period of time. It's been miserable. Everyone hates it. It doesn't mean anything. I don't have to get to the bottom. I don't even have to get you know near the bottom. I have to just have to get the, the, the piece of the move where things are getting better. And obviously, the closer to the bottom I am, you know, the more the, the less risk I'm going to take. But um, I just have to catch the piece where it's inflecting. I wonder if uh, Wall Street isn't going to learn to appreciate earnings a lot more in the next ten years. <laughs> I think they will. I really think they will. <laughs> um, you know, revenue has just been such a big driver of uh, portfolio returns, and I don't see why it matters. I mean, you can create revenue; you can't create earnings. So, no, I think uh, people are going to really care a lot more about uh, earnings. And, you know, I'm very cash flow focused because earnings don't mean anything if you don't put cash in your pocket. I mean, that's what we learned with shell companies. You know, they, they put the cash in the ground. And, you know, so what? If you have a bunch of earnings, it doesn't mean anything. I, I want cash. You know, I'm in, I'm in the cash business. So I'm just really, you know, saying what are, what are the reinvestment opportunities? What's the rate of uh, return on, on the capital deployed? And does that capital have to get deployed back in the business or can it you know, go back to me and buy back some dividends? In, in the end, what I've learned with a lot of these smaller companies, Wall Street you know, likes growth, but small companies you know, below 10 billion market cap, Wall Street doesn't really care. So you need something to make Wall Street care. And if you buy back a couple percent of the company each quarter and you do it for you know, long periods of time and mm-hmm. you accelerate it when there's a pullback, so you put a floor under the thing, Wall Street notices because suddenly the chart starts looking right because it's up and to the right because every time there's a pullback, you step up the buyback. And Wall Street likes that. And then the computers, you know, the computers are always just looking at, you know, relative strength and earnings growth. They, they, they like it. And so much of the world's run by computers these days. And then it gets added to the ETFs. The ETFs buy it. And, you know, it gets added to indexes. They buy it. It's all like very, very reflexive. And, you know, if you have one of these companies that's not buying back its stock, well, it gets left for dead. It, it trades at three times earnings forever. I mean, you know, some of them, they buy back a ton of stock and it still trades at three times earnings. I mean, look at all the coal companies. They, they, they shrink mm-hmm. the share count like 10% every quarter and no one cares. But, I mean, at least the stocks are up. I mean, if they had just given you dividends, the stocks would have never gone anywhere. Um, buybacks are very important, I think. I, I don't think enough small companies use the buybacks. Noted. All right. Um I think we're actually sort of near the end of our time here. Um, and yeah. I want to get your take on, on my final question, which 
You've answered it before. I hope you don't remember it because it works better that way. It's the exact same question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's a non-financial topic, exact same question. And that is simply, if you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? Oh, be very, very cynical and skeptical of everything. Everyone's trying to sell you something. And even if you don't think they're trying to sell you something, they are. Everyone has an agenda. And just be cynical. Read everything there is to read. Learn everything there is to, you know, this is a, this is a game of knowledge. Uh, whoever knows more makes the money. And just be, scan- be really cynical. Cynical, skeptical, knowledgeable. All right. Um, hey, Cuppy, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Hey, happy to. Yeah. So, all right. Well, you're definitely going to get a call from us in another six or 12 months. I hope you're still doing podcasts Great. by then. Let's do it again. Yeah. Good. We will. <laughs> all right. Th- cool. Cool. Thank you. Folks, the potential as well as the possible peril of AI has captured the world's attention this year. Goldman Sachs says 300 million jobs could be affected. That's almost the size of the United States. Others say it will create trillions of dollars in new wealth. In fact, it's already propelled one company to soar up to a trillion dollar valuation just this year. And today, the global race to find ways to commercialize AI and turn it into profits is officially on. That's why two Wall Street legends, Mark Chaikin and Dr. David Eifrig, are teaming up for the first time ever on July 19th to reveal how artificial intelligence has just shattered one of the most important barriers in technological history. The one decision you may need to make with your money right now, even if you don't realize it, and why 2023 will be remembered as the year the great AI race began. With over 90 years of combined investing experience, there's nobody better to cut through the hype, answer all your most burning questions about what AI really means for your money, and help you find the real opportunities to position yourself to grow your wealth as this story accelerates in the months ahead. I urge you to tune in and consider what they have to say carefully. Just head to AIRaceEvent.com for full details. Again, Mark and Doc will go live on Wednesday, July 19th with all the critical details. You do not want to miss this. Head to AIRaceEvent.com right now to make sure you're on their list for updates. Again, that's AIRaceEvent.com. It's 100% free. Well, Cuppy, obviously, is one of my favorite voices in the the financial universe today. And I had to have him on, if for no other reason, just to hear him talk about uranium, because, you know, he obviously loves uranium. And I'm glad to hear the way, you you probably noticed the way he distinguished his conviction on the uranium trade versus copper, right? And the way he also described the um, oil and gas services trade, I thought was really valuable. the lack of investment that we've seen in that sector since 2014, et cetera, et cetera, and needing to get back to 2014 levels, but in inflation adjusted terms that I think that was really valuable too. Um, it's always a good time talking with Cuppy. So you can follow him on, uh, Twitter. I think, yeah, he's still on Twitter. Um, I haven't seen much of him lately, but yeah, good talk. Always a good talk with him. And there's always a good idea. I don't know if you, If you go back through the archives, you can see previous episodes where we've had him as a guest and he's always got a good solid idea and throws out some, some names of stocks that he likes too. Uh, And I know you like that. I I know I do too. Yeah. It's always a good time talking with him. Well, that's another interview and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com. Click on the episode you want. Scroll all the way down. Click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com, please. And also do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or call our listener feedback line 
800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.